Good morning. Today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Last time we finished chapter 7, so we'll begin a new chapter. Now this particular chapter is a continuation actually from the prior one. Uh, the last four studies are now online from that chapter and you're welcome to review those leading up to this. And as we concluded last time, the religious leaders um, of that time were all, they had all plotted against Jesus and their plot had been foiled and they all just went home. But Jesus had other things to do. And so now we'll be reading from the King James, uh, New King James Version, Gospel of John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. Let's throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted of their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And here I'll conclude with verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, that's just, a, that's just the beginning of chapter 8, and there's a lot in chapter 8 here. A lot of teaching, a lot of wonderful truth, and of course, dealing with detractors. <laughs> which seems to have taken up a lot of the narrative here. And, and I, I'd like to mention at this point that Jesus really did spend much more time teaching and ministering and, and healing people than he did being attacked by his enemies. Okay? Uh, earlier in Galilee, he had healed many people, many diseased people. He met with his disciples. He taught many on a mountainside all day long. He had miraculously provided food for thousands of people. Uh, People actually tried to make him king. He traveled across the Sea of Galilee, and during the night he had calmed down a big storm before getting to Capernaum, where he was teaching in a synagogue the next day and likely was teaching for several hours. And then there was probably a half hour or less when his opponents began stirring up trouble and, um, among those that were listening to Jesus. And what do we read, though? About half of that chapter was dealing with the relatively short time of conflict. So this kind of reconfirms to me that the Gospel of John is an actual eyewitness account. It's not a made-up story. Uh, you know, if we're making up a story about, stories about a, a miracle-working man, <clears throat> supernatural miracle-working man, we probably want to take up so much space with the detractors uh, and the recurring conflicts that were, were going on. We build up the miracle man. We give plenty of shiny details with lots of tear-jerking stories of incredible healings and and then we wait until near the end to bring the bad guys in and, and focus on that for a while um, then we pull a surprise ending <laughs> but that's not at all what we see in the gospel of john we see an eyewitness account of a real person and real events that actually happened why do i say this because our life lesson tells us or it brings us to the life lesson that we can trust the Gospel of John to be true. We can trust the whole Bible to be true. We can trust the Gospel of John to be true. We can trust the whole Bible to be true. Let's look at verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, Jesus loved the Mount of Olives. Loved the place. It's also called Mount Olivet. 
It's less than a mile away from the temple. It's actually out of town from Jerusalem, but it's about a half hour's walk away. And this is the first and only time that uh, John mentions it in this gospel. Uh, but there are a lot of other scriptures that reference this place. as It's one of three mounts on a ridge that are overlooking, rise up overlooking Jerusalem. Um, this was where King David fled when his son Absalom uh, rebelled against him. King Solomon actually built pagan temples at this place to make his foreign wives happy. God was not happy at all with that. <laughs> Ezekiel had a vision of the glory of the Lord descending from the city and stopping on the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah prophesied something that is yet to come, that the Lord will stand on this mount in the final victory over evil, and it will actually be split in two from east to west. So in other gospel accounts, we see Jesus and the disciples on the mount quite a bit. It was a, a peaceful place. It had a, a great view of Jerusalem. Many of the pictures of Jerusalem you see are taken from the Mount of Olives. In times of feasts, a great many of those that set up the tents during the Feast of Tabernacles would, would put their tents there. And, and interestingly, uh, even in Jesus' time, the place had already become a cemetery and was, had been a cemetery for over a thousand years. Why, why is that? Because people believe that those buried there would be the first ones to see the, the Messiah when they were the first to be resurrected when the Messiah came and they would see him. So what does the Bible tell us about this resurrection when Jesus returns? It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, that's not just something to hang in your nursery, okay, in your, in your church. Okay. In, <laughs> we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, it reveals some more details. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. What a great day that's going to be. I can see why they would want to be anywhere in line, but first in line, that would be kind of cool. Um, but I, I thought I'd like to be alive during that time as well. Um, but, you know, if more people can come to Jesus by his delaying his return, I'm okay with that too. You know, I say, sometimes I say, Lord, come back. And then it's like, oh, there's still, still so many that need to know you. So it's up to him. We'll let him decide. But back to the text, I, I think Jesus knew that he had a lot more to deal with in Jerusalem, and I think he probably went up to the mount to pray, which he did. Uh, he often prayed into the night, sometimes overnight, all night long. He communed with the Father for his instructions, but it doesn't tell us here he could have just gone there to sleep. But it wasn't for long if he did, because we read in verse 2, Now early the next morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. <laughs> it's funny, they, they thought they were rid of Jesus, but Jesus remained in Jerusalem for a few more days after the Feast of Tabernacles. Though the religious authorities wanted to silence and arrest him, he still boldly taught large crowds in the most public place in Jerusalem, in the temple. Christ was always telling people the good news, uh, no matter whether it was convenient for him or not. I don't get up at five in the morning and start preaching out here on the campground. <laughs> but this was kind of the equivalent of Jesus doing just that. And people were coming. Our life lesson for us, though, is share the good news even when it's not convenient. Share the good news even when it's not convenient. Now, there are three things that are notable here about this, this passage. And that is, first of all, he started early in the morning. Even though he was out of town, I don't think he got much sleep. But he started working for the kingdom early in the morning. The second thing, he picked a place that had people, a busy place to teach. Although the feast had ended, there were still a lot of people uh, hanging around, coming and going, and Jesus wanted to be where there were people and where these people were reachable. And the third thing is, he sat down. I probably would sit down here. <laughs> but it wasn't, he wasn't just going to give a 15-minute sermonette and leave. 
okay? Uh, Jesus sat down as a teacher, and that day, a teacher with great authority would sit down, and people would gather around him, and they'd plan to sit down for a long time and listen. And he would bring the good news to all who would come and listen to him. And boy, did they come. What does the scripture say? It says, all the people came to him. Okay? And they, they hadn't advertised this on TV or radio, or they didn't even post it on Facebook or Twitter that Jesus was going to be here. <laughs> but it doesn't, say, it doesn't really say who all were. But when Jesus showed up again in the temple, after what happened the day before, I think word spread pretty quickly. It's likely that a few thousand people were still in the temple area when Jesus went in there and began teaching. And um, he happily took the time. To, to teach them more things that they needed to know about the kingdom. Now, what Jesus taught them here, at this part, is not recorded. But John did say that even if everything had been written down, the world couldn't hold all the books. So, I can forgive him for that. <laughs> okay. Um, but he was, busy. he was busy. Verse 3 says, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This, said, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now I'm going to stop in the middle of verse 6 and make a few observations. This passage is taught on quite a bit, and you know the background is commonly known, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details about that, but I do have some, some thoughts and, and even some questions that I don't have answers for. <laughs> but here's what I think was happening. It was a setup. I mean, if they caught her in the very act, doesn't it mean that there was some guy who would have also had to be there? Well, you know, was it one of the accusers? One of his detractors that set it up, maybe even hired the lady himself and, and uh, you know, knew where to find a woman. They saw Jesus in the temple. Oh, we're going to trick him. Went in early in the morning, make an appointment, got things going, did the deed. You know, had his buddies outside the door to come in and catch them in the very act. They grabbed her while he slipped away. I mean, we don't know. We know the man wasn't there. But Jesus knew the truth about the situation. So the huge elephant in the room is, why didn't they insist on bringing in the man? If they wanted to follow the law, they conveniently left out a pretty important part of it. Deuteronomy 22, 22 clearly says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So shalt thou put away evil from Israel. So to begin with, these religious people were ignoring half of the law. Plus, they missed the entire point of the law, which was, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. And this happens in several ways. Obviously, offenders can't become repeat offenders if this punishment is carried out. Um, and there's also the example and the message that it sends to everyone else that, yes, this is the law, and they're serious about having a death penalty. Very good preventative. So... They kind of ignored the laws. Next, these teachers and lawyers brought the woman to Jesus. They were the rulers and the lawyers, not Jesus. But they were so insistent that everyone follow the law, why didn't they carry out their own law or carry out the laws? I'm pretty sure because, honestly, they did not have any authority to do so. Um, yes, it was Israel, but they were living under Roman rule. The Romans didn't have the same law against adultery. In fact, the, the women were rarely punished, if at all. Um, Roman law actually did allow shaming the man and woman a little bit. I checked out some of the laws, but, but not executing them. That was not part of their law. Um, but if in a fit of rage, a husband came in, found a man having adultery with his wife and killed, <laughs> killed him, there is great leniency allowed for that husband. Most of the time, they, did, they went unpunished. But one more interesting law that I found was that if a father of a married woman found another man committing adultery with his daughter at one of their homes, he was allowed to kill the offending man on the spot, but he couldn't touch the woman. So 
the more, more important part of this was the man is the one to be punished, both under Israel and under uh, Roman law. Anyway, the, the, the Jews could not legally enforce the Old Testament penalty under the Roman law, but they actually did stone people to death at times through mob action. Okay, that way no individual could be charged with the murder. They were all throwing stones and killing somebody. The, the whole thing was really about what John said. They wanted to trick Jesus into saying something that would diminish his influence, would diminish him. Anything he said at this point would be wrong. You know, hey, we got him. If he said, yes, follow the Mosaic law and execute her, though the man is not here, then he'd seem really harsh and cruel under these suspicious circumstances that they brought her there with. Plus, the rulers would then go to the Romans and, and tell them Jesus was rebelling against Rome for doing something illegal or encouraging illegal activity, and they'd get the Romans to arrest him for that. On the other hand, if he said, no, don't follow the Mosaic law, then they would have ammunition to tell the people, he's teaching people not to follow Moses. You know, how could he be the Messiah? There's no way he could be the Messiah if he's teaching people against the moral teachings and the standards that Moses had brought. But you see, Jesus didn't just blurt out an answer, did he? Verse 6, B, the second part of it, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, although he did, as though he did not hear. Jesus was already, picture this, Jesus was already sitting down, so he just started doodling in the dirt or whatever was on the floor. We'll, we'll touch that in a minute. Um, the big question is, what was Jesus writing that made his accusers leave? The passage said the man had to be executed as well. Maybe he was writing that. The passage said, uh, you know, maybe he had the names of the accusers, started writing their names down, and they were afraid he would start writing their sins down too. Uh, could be the commandment to not bear false witness. I, I thought maybe it was Psalm 136, where he says, for his mercy endures forever 26 times as he was about to show mercy to this woman. Or maybe one of the deeper explanations of the law, because he said, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what was it he was writing down? Nobody knows? Well, I, actually, I, I think I do. I know what he did. Okay. He didn't write anything down. Well, actually, nothing of importance, nothing that related to that, I don't think. Um, I think he was just ignoring their stupid questions. <laughs> I mean, he, he knew what was going on. He knew the, the whole scene, and he was just ignoring them. It says, it's, note it says, as though he did not hear. Okay, Jesus ignored him. He knew, he knew what was happening. These people had not talked face to face with him for quite a while, and then suddenly they're coming to him, and they wanted advice on a matter that they already knew so well. <laughs> yeah. So he was just acting like he didn't even hear them. But he knew their thoughts, and he also knew the details of the trap that they were setting involving this woman. Now, I'm not going to say involving this innocent woman. Obviously, you know, the, the Scripture does say that she was caught in the very act, and so that happened. So she, she had sinned. She was not innocent, but she, in, in this trap to try to kill Jesus, you know, she was probably not part of that, that act because she could have been killed. Verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. <laughs> they weren't used to being ignored. You know, these, these leaders and rulers whose very presence commanded respect from the people and, and authority, but not so in the presence of Jesus. Finally, yes, he did stand up. They had been getting more and more upset at him because in their minds, they knew they'd trapped him, kill her or set her free. But Jesus persisted in ignoring them. But then something else began to happen. Jesus was writing. Possibly they remembered Belshazzar, how he had been scared when there was a hand writing on the wall, the hand of God writing on the wall. Okay, this is how my, my mind works. Uh, I, 
Jesus was in the temple. Consider this, the archaeologists discovered the floor of the temple. What was the floor of the temple that he was teaching in, made out of? They found stones of all sorts. It was, much of it was hand-tooled limestone from the Dead Sea that had imported marble there. And so I thought, well, maybe, just maybe, the same finger that wrote the commandments on the tablets that Moses brought down from the mountain was here writing on the stones in the temple. The ground in the temple was likely rock or marble. If you go there today, you don't walk around on dirt in the temple. And they're old stones, thousands of years old. I mean, not the temple, but the temple grounds where, where the temple had been. I mean, it's just something to think about. <laughs> just imagine the, the situation uh, if, if that was, if he was actually writing in, into the stone with his finger and they're saying, I'm not going to deal with this. This is God. They started to slip out. Verse, verse 9, Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst, being convicted by their conscience. I, th I find it interesting. The oldest went out first. Ever since I was a child, I, I kind of gravitated. I tended to seek out the company of older people so I could learn. Instinctively, I knew they were generally smarter and maybe godlier than younger people as a whole. They had more life experience, more understanding, more wisdom. And the book of Romans tells us that men who never had the law did good and right things because God's law was written on their hearts. Okay, that's what a conscience is. That's what we call a conscience. And although atheists, for instance, they deny there's a God, but they say they can still be good moral people. Well, without realizing it, that's them admitting that God has given them a conscience, has written on their hearts what is right and wrong. Man had been forbidden from eating the fruit of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It opened their hearts to evil, but God also balanced that out with a knowledge of good to counter the evil. And it's been that way ever since. The scriptures do say that some consciences are weak. Some consciences will actually be different than others. It's, it's scriptural. And some have even defiled and suppressed their consciences by ignoring them. But that their consciences actually can come back from the dead, so to speak, and be made more alive by faith in God. So it's exciting to know that when we confess our sins, Jesus forgives us, not only is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but also cleanses us from all unrighteousness as well. And although these men had gotten riled up to the point where they were wanting to entrap the very Son of God in their plot to bring Him down and to, future their own, to uh, um, further their own careers, the mechanism that God put in place was still working in their hearts and lives. So they all just left knowing in themselves that um, not only would it be wrong to kill this woman, maybe it would also be wrong to try to trap Jesus in this situation. That would be wrong as well. So uh, ironically, we see the trap they had set hadn't sprung, but it caught them. It didn't catch Jesus. It caught them instead of Jesus in the trap. It's common to see, uh, it's a common sin to, for us and for others to desire to punish the sin of others while ignoring our own sin. It's called being a hypocrite. Um, if you've never been hypocritical about something, see me after the, the teaching here and uh, you know, I'll take about five minutes and we'll figure out where you have done that, okay? <laughs> um, something we can repent of. We, we recall that King David you know, had told the prophet Nathan that the man who stole and killed the pet lamb of another man, he should surely be put to death but he himself had been hiding a much greater sin. If we look at the sin, if we must look at the sins of others, we must be aware that we have also sinned. There is a place, don't get me wrong, there is still a place for exposing and rebuking and directly dealing with the sins of others, especially of those in the family of God, our brothers and sisters. But it must always be done with the heart that recognizes that we have been forgiven. And that the other person is someone that God wants to forgive, not someone that God wants to kill or that we want to kill. Now, when done right, properly, confronting sin in others is done more often with tears and a broken heart 
than with anger and condemnation. It brings about repentance and restoration. Our life lesson here is that correcting others is only to be done to bring restoration. Correcting others is only to be done to bring restoration. Now, we see in this case, in this situation, Jesus had given plenty of time for everyone to calm down. And he himself diffused the tension by actions that were calm and not intimidating or confronting to others that were in the wrong here. Yes, the woman was shamed, probably in the worst way possible. And we should understand, though, that guilt and shame is a temporary. I mean, it can serve a helpful purpose, but it is a temporary situation. God never intended it to be a permanent condition in our lives. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in our lives and wrongdoing, it doesn't start with a heavy hammer, you know, browbeating us and, and hitting us. It's a gentle nudge, reminding us that there's some business that we need to take care of with God. If we ignore his gentle nudges, it's to our own peril. We've talked before about quenching the Holy Spirit of God uh, and how we must not do that. So in our text, at this point, every last accuser was gone, leaving only Jesus and the accused woman. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? I noticed the accusers left as Jesus was bowed to the ground, riding in the dirt. I think it was interesting. He, he gave them an out. Sometimes we want to, when someone's done wrong, we want to pile up the evidence against them and just really nail them with it. I see here Jesus didn't do that. He gave them a way to get away and cease their sin, cease their wrongdoing, cease their hypocrisy without making a big deal of it something we should consider when we see that in someone else's life. They, so they, he was looking down, riding on the ground. So now her accusers were gone when he looks up, when he gets up and there's no one else left to condemn the woman. Again, the trap for Jesus had sprung, caught the holier than thou hypocrites, had brought this woman into God's temple to condemn her and they got out. With no accusers, there was only the woman who had sinned, looking in the very face of God that she had sinned against. Now, if this was one of us, what would we be thinking? And sometimes we think, oh, this is the wonderful part of the story. Well, at this point, to me, if I was that woman, this would be the scariest part of the story. Uh, my life would probably be flashing before my eyes, knowing I only had moments to live because I had actually met my maker. I had sinned, you know, a, a, a capital crime, and he was going to be the only one there left to judge me. And we read in verse 11, she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The original word for go, I like to look these things up. What does that really mean? It says, this is one that carries the meaning to continue on life's journey. <laughs> I like the way the Amplified Version uh, Bible translates it. Verse 11 says, She answered, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go your way, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus sent her away with the command and the ability to stop sinning, to not remain in a state of sinning. Some say that since we're human, we're going to sin all the time in, in many ways. But remember, when Jesus tells you to do something, it's possible. He provides the means to do it. He told the lame man to walk, I and mean, the man was lame, but he walked. He told Peter to step out onto the water, not into the water, and Peter stepped out onto the water, not into the water. Way back during creation, he told light to appear. He told the water to gather together and for the land to appear, and many other things, and they happened. Don't ask me how his speaking gives the power for things to happen. I don't know. It just happens. He's God. He can do it any way he wants to. At other times, he actually makes things and, and creates things. Um, sometimes he tells us to do things that will end up bringing about miracles. And that's up to him. It's only up to us to follow. So let's note that Jesus 
sent away the forgiven woman and she had not approved of and I mean he had not approved of and he had not accepted her sin okay he certainly wasn't celebrating this sin that she had but as we inferred earlier it's quite possible that this was not a one-time thing with this woman it may have been you know regular practice of hers it doesn't say anything about money being exchanged but that may have been the situation too we just don't know but then Jesus told her stop your sinful habit be done with it sin no more some have read the words neither do I condemn you and stopped there without considering the other words go your way and from now on sin no more now that's a serious mistake and it's literally a twisting of the words of, I mean the words of Christ uh, twisting means leaving out part of what he said okay and, and or or putting it in a different context so they, they take it in a way to make it think that he was approving of this adultery <laughs> wrong okay he absolutely did not approve but even in some of the early copies of the book of John uh, the story was left out if you might have a, a footnote a version of the Bible that, that either leaves out that section altogether or it might have a footnote that says uh, this does not appear in early manuscripts well that's true okay it, it's true but the reason why is because some misguided scribes looking at this misunderstood Jesus meanings and took it on themselves to drop that story out of it but we know from a lot of other areas a lot of ways that this really is in the scripture is really is in uh, the book of John at this point so our life lesson for us is that is don't ignore parts of the Bible that you don't understand instead dig in and find out the incredible truths of God don't ignore the parts of the Bible you don't understand instead dig in and find out the incredible truths of God so what did they miss when they would do that when they leave the parts of the Bible out like this so we see Jesus did several things first he fully recognized that the woman had done sin what she had done was sin because he told her stop sinning second thing is he told her what to do next told her to repent turn around and not to continue in her sin and third he gave her hope that her life could go on and be lived fully in freedom from sexual sin which was totally not in her mind you know she didn't think that could happen and fourth he gave her a word of hope to speak against the shame that could later threaten to overwhelm her life this woman needed hope because the consequences of her sin by itself were going to be severe enough um, after this likely that she would be shunned by her community possibly rejected by her husband if she was married and and um, you know maybe even divorced if uh, yeah, if she was married but from that well she had to be married or else she wouldn't be committing adultery right okay <laughs> but Jesus gave her the strength to live on and from now on she will not be known as the adulterous woman around town by those and by those who learn from this account she will now be known as the forgiven woman what a change Jesus said he did not condemn her yes the woman guilty of sin a great sin suddenly discovered the goodness of having no condemnation she passed from sin and death a sin and death sentence to forgiveness and life Jesus really did take her guilt upon himself and the heat was on him the question was in the air and now he lifts up the guilt and the shame he was the only one that didn't have sin among them he had the right to cast that first stone they all knew that but what was he doing he was doodling in the dirt or riding on the ground the woman found refuge in this connection to Jesus the accusers were actually trying to get a thrill out of exercising their power to condemn this woman they caught they'd probably done that with others probably many others but Jesus knew the blessings of exercising his power to forgive not only to forgive a violation towards another human but also I mean we might muster up enough courage to to forgive someone else that's wronged us but also he removed the eternal consequences of this sin against God Jesus is showing us here again that there's a great truth that we see in Romans 8 1 that Paul speaks of that there is no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not only that, he's also illustrating his own words. That he's, he spoke in that incredible verse a few chapters back in, in John 3, 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's just an awesome lesson we've learned from, from this. Not just about this woman and the particular sin that she had, but about us and how to handle sin and how to handle you know, those that sin against us or those that we see sinning against God. Um, what a blessing to, 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 to see in these things. But we do have one more verse we're going to touch on this week, uh, go into more next week. And what we see here is between verse uh, 11 and 12, there's a passage of time here. We don't know how long. We know it's not weeks or anything, but it's you know, a few minutes, maybe an hour. Um, but by this time, the forgiven woman probably had gone out. The scribes and Pharisees uh, likely saw her walk out alive and happy, and they were not happy at this point. But they had gone back in and begun listening to Jesus once again. But I think this verse does connect to what we just saw happen, because verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We know the darkness can't stand it when light shines. Try that in a room. Try turning a light on and find, find darkness anywhere. It doesn't happen. <laughs> okay, it just doesn't happen. What an awesome account we have here of someone walking in darkness, brought before God himself, provably guilty, yet she meets the light of the world, ceases walking in that darkness, but has in her that light of life. It could have been you. It could have been me. We've all sinned. We all need God's forgiveness. And as we see the love and compassion Jesus has for us, we have a choice. Even if we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of one of those messes that we tend to get ourselves into, um, we can be forgiven and follow Jesus into light and life, or we can reject his forgiveness and walk in darkness. That's the choice this woman had from that point on for the rest of her life. I tend to think she probably choose that light and life. So much better than darkness. I, I must admit, I, I was a little, little bit puzzled by Jesus' declaration of forgiveness before instructing her to walk without sin. I don't condemn you, just go out and don't ever, don't sin again, just stop sinning. But, you know, isn't that the way it works in our life too? You know, there's no way we can walk without sin in our own power. It's the power of God. Walking without sin doesn't bring salvation. But, as a re but, but instead, walking without sin, not walking in sin, is a result of salvation. Okay? As a wiser man once said, Speaking of Jesus said, love transformed into mercy restores right relationship and justice by restoring the dignity and value of the offending party. Furthermore, furthermore, mercy always calls the sinner to conversion. Just something interesting to think about. But if you need forgiveness today, take a few minutes, ask God to forgive your sin, believe in Jesus, you know, that he's trustworthy, reliable, he's worthy to follow, he died on the cross, so that you could ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he will. He will. He'll give you the power to live right every day. Don't take that for granted. We all need him in our lives every day. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to walk in the life and light that Jesus provides. And brothers and sisters, there's nothing better in life than living for Jesus. Nothing. Let him rule over area, every area of your life today. So thank you for being here. As we close, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.